Let us pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, to open up your word. Help us to receive from your word what you'd have us to receive. We ask you, Lord, to help us to apply it to our lives and to live according to your word in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Let us turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with the 15th verse. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with the 15th verse. See that none render evil for evil, for any man but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see here that first thing that's stated here is render not evil for evil. Now we live in a society that in many ways follows an entirely different mindset. There's an old military expression saying the enemy sets the rules of combat. So if the enemy is ruthless and, and doing brut brutal things, then that makes it okay for you to do it. That, uh, that's how they've justified many things that would be classified as war crimes today. But that's not the way it is with Christians. Just because someone's being evil to us does not give us the right to be evil in return. Because the majority of the world is evil, but God has called us out of that into something better. He has taken and called us to a higher plane, to a position in life that is greater than wh where we came from. So just because the rest of the world is doing it doesn't mean it's okay for us to do it. I, I've taken and heard people say, oh, well, two million people can't be wrong. Sure they can be. There are several billion people out there who are wrong. Just because a large number of people are doing it doesn't make it right. In fact, just because it's legal according to the law of our country doesn't make it right. God's morals are not confined by man's rules and man's way of viewing things. God sets a, a higher standard. He doesn't want us acting like the rest of the world. He wants us operating on a different plane. Oh, I've heard it so many times, especially on the radio. It's amazing how many preachers there are fe preaching false doctrine on the radio. They go through and, well, as long as you've been saved, God overlooks the things you do because he knows that in your, your flesh is, in, is innately evil. And as long as you're in the flesh and walking in this world, you can't help but be an evil person. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does say that the flesh is evil, but what it's referring to is when you're in sin. Because it, it says that you're in the flesh or you're in the spirit. And if you are walking with God and are taking a walking in the spirit of God, if you're saved and sanctified, you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. So you're not limited by the limitations of the flesh. But so many 
are out there claiming to be Christians, are being taught they're Christians, when in actuality what they are are good moral sinners. And you know a good moral sinner is just as evil as an immoral sinner. They just have a code of conduct they follow. And you know, I've noticed that many of these moral sinners, yeah, I'm sure you've met them, they go through and they say, oh, well, yes, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, in, and, they, and there's nothing that even shows that they've been saved. And they go through and they live their lives just as wicked and evil as the others, yet they're claiming, well, I understand on a higher plane because of Jesus. No, you need to get saved and get sanctified and walk in a holy life. We cannot take and go through and be a carnal, corrupt people and, be, and please God. It's not possible. And many are taking, going through, and they're giving lip service to serving God. Where the Bible says, rejoice evermore. They're so used to getting their own way, they never think to rejoice. Many of them don't even see God moving in their permits. Maybe because they haven't had enough hard times. Or they're so busy taking, and do, taking care of it themselves, they don't know when God moves if they're in a position that God's going to move for them in the first place. Because God doesn't go around blessing people that he wants to take and get saved unless that blessing will bring them to him. Pray without ceasing. We should always be in an attitude of prayer. We should be able to take anything to God instantly. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. And we need to be thankful. But so many will take and they'll go through the lip service and they'll, they'll rejoice. They'll go through their prayers. Most of the time they're ritualistic prayers, but they're, they'll go through them. They'll even say thank you in those prayers. But when it comes to following the Spirit of God, they quench it. Just like an old wet blanket. Now, last fall, we were burning some wood out on the shoreline, out at the campground. And the wind came up and it was blowing a gale. And needless to say, the fire got away from us. Now, how we put the fire out? was I took a towel and I dunked it in a bucket of water and beat the fire out. And that's what people are doing with the Holy Ghost. They're taking and trying their best to put his fire out in their lives because they don't want to follow him. They don't want to be stirred. They don't want anything that would take and put them on fire for God where they might stand out and be, oh, that person's different. No, they want to take and stand by and be like, able to blend in and look like everybody else. But God doesn't want us to look like everyone else. He wants us to be different. Despise not prophesying. It's amazing how many times people will take and turn on you because you are presenting the truth. The term prophesy is to foretell the word of God. It's not to foretell the word of God. That term um, can be part of it, but it's not always. Just speaking forth the word of God is prophecy. So when, they, when God comes through and says, Thus saith the Lord, if you don't listen to it, and you despise it, you're despising prophecy. 
But many will, if, it, if the preacher isn't up there t- saying what they want to hear, it's, well, that preacher, he's just got all, all kinds of problems. He t- takes and doesn't agree with me. And everybody knows that I'm always right. Well, the only one that's always right is God. And when it comes down to the Word, the Word of God is always right. So if the preaching carries forth something that steps on your toes and it's from the Word of God, then you need to take and get your life into line with the Word. Now, if the preaching is, does not line up with the Word of God, disregard the preaching. Because that's uh, that would be false doctrine then, and we have a whole lot of that in our society. Despise not the uh, the word of God. Then it goes on to tell us to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So while we're not supposed to despise the prophecy, we're supposed to check it with the scriptures and make sure it's right. Make sure that what we're being told matches up to the scriptures. Instead of having somebody come through and try to take and say that the movement of God is, well, the Spirit of God will get a hold of you and he'll shake you up and he'll throw you down on the floor and make you foam at the mouth and babble like an idiot. Yes. Every instance where God took and moved with somebody, they either jumped up or spoke languages they didn't know before or worked miracles or healing, or proclaim the word of God. You didn't have them taking and making a spectacle of themselves where people have to come in and throw blankets over them so they can remain decent. They also, uh, God also doesn't go through and tell you to take and live a holy life and turn around and say, well, you just can't help it. Yes, we're telling you it'll be to live sinless, but you got it, but you can't help with sin. What do they think? God's a schizophrenic or something? God wants us to live who hit the power of his spirit and live holy. He wants to sanctify us completely, and that can only be done through the Spirit of God. The term sanctify is to be cleansed and set aside for a purpose. And that's when he takes, and after we are saved, he watches us of that Adamic nature, and he comes in and he fills us with his spirit and gives us a job to do. So it is important that we take and walk in the spirit of God. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6 starting with the 27th verse. But I say unto you, which hear, or love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them, which despitefully use you. Unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer the other, also the other. And he that taketh away the, uh, thy cloak, forbid not that he take away thy coat also. So just because they're taking and doing awful things to you, the Bible teaches that we're taking and love them, do good for them, pray for them. They may cuss you up a blue streak, maybe trying to destroy you, maybe trying to get you canceled in our modern cancel culture. It's amazing how many people have lost their jobs because of some perverted, evil individual didn't like what they had to say. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that got canceled was saying good things, but 
the the fact is is that it's not our position to destroy people's lives just because they say something we don't like. No, our position is to take and show them the truth so they can find a better way to live and actually take and improve their lives. The world wants to break down and destroy. The world wants to corrupt. The world wants to burn society down. Why? Because they're evil. I know that's po not politically correct, but it's true. They're evil. They don't know God, many of which even reject his very existence. Some that do acknowledge his existence are only looking at some kind of a lesser God. They're not actually serving the true God. And they wonder, why is society doing evil things? I've heard atheists argue, oh, well, there can't possibly be a God because look at all this war and pestilence and disease and all this horrible things that people do to each other. Obviously, there is no God. Well, I'm sorry, but man has a free will. And just because man is evil doesn't mean God is. Man may do a lot of wicked things to, the, uh, to themselves and to each other. But God is not responsible for the actions of evil men and women. They have a problem with the species being man even though that's what it, the Bible refers to it as. God wants us to stand forth and show them how they should be living. So it's not just a verbal thing, it's an action thing. We go forth and we demonstrate to the world what they should be doing. Let's go to James chapter 5, verse 10. We'll be starting with verse 10 of James chapter 5. James chapter 5, starting with the 10th verse. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and, te and tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So we look at the, it says we look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering. Now it was quite common for people to kill the prophets or to lock them up because they didn't like what they had to say. When it comes down to it, History tells us that Isaiah was stuffed into a log and sawn in half. We know that um, Jeremiah was locked up and then drug off into Egypt. They were, they did not have these pristine lives where nothing ever went wrong. There's a false doctrine being peddled today that, oh, well, if you serve Jesus, then nothing bad can ever touch you. If anything bad happens, then clearly you are not where you should be with God. Suffering is not uncommon. Especially being that the world wants to destroy all that is good. So 
if you happen to suffer for the Lord, the Bible teaches you're blessed. So it is important that we understand that not everything goes perfectly in man's eyes in our lives. Why? Because most men are evil. And they're going to attack that which is good. God wants us to take a stand and show the world what he really is like despite their, uh, their actions, and not give in and tell them what they want to hear. But let, uh, let what we say be definitely, provably true. Oh, there's a great temptation in humanity that when you know you're going to take and ha suffer from what you're going to say, just to tell them what they want to hear. They say that is one reason why you cannot trust po most polls anymore. Because people tend to either not answer them at all or tell them what they want to hear. Well, that doesn't exactly show where public opinion is, does it? Problem is, a lot of preachers are telling people what they want to hear. Michael's fond of taking and telling me that, I'll, that if I was to preach at this congregation or that congregation, they'd ask me to leave. And I always tell him, well, it wouldn't be the first time because <laughs> I've been asked to leave before because they didn't want to hear the word. They wanted to tell me what I could and could not preach out of the word, limiting it so that it wouldn't hurt anybody's feelings. And this was before the age of the snowflake. Now that they have all are carrying their emotions on their sleeves, you're going to offend people if you tell them anything that doesn't go directly along with what they already believe. So why worry about it? Just tell them. Just share the word. First Peter chapter 1, starting with the 15th verse. That's First Peter chapter 1, starting with the 15th verse. But as he hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, I want to point something out here. In Greek, this word that's translated conversation means word and deed. It doesn't just mean, oh, well, talk good. Well, you know, you shouldn't be using profanity, so you better take and be holy in your conversation. No, it's more than that. Yes, you shouldn't be using profanity, but no, it's not just talking about that. It's talking about be holy in every aspect of your life. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Most, most preachers out there today will say, oh, well, that's the ever-receding goal. We strive for it, but we never can reach it. So we're just always taking and just missing out. So it's, uh, we attempt to be holy. It doesn't say that, though. It doesn't say, well, try to be holy as I am holy. It doesn't go through and say, oh, well, pretend to be holy for I am holy. It doesn't go through and say, well, be ceremonially holy for I am holy. No, it says be holy. That means without sin. You cannot live a holy life and live in sin. The two are incompatible. It will not work. And if you have gotten saved and then you go back and you live in sin, you're a sinner. This whole notion of, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace is nonsense. 
You're either a sinner or you're saved by grace. The two are incompatible. You either are living a holy life or you're going bound for hell. There is no two ways about it. Most of the world, most of our country, most of the world who are claiming to be Christians today are actually sinners bound for, the, for an eternal hell and need to repent and become holy. Now I grant you there are some Christians that have been lied to about what a sin is that are actually living a holy life and don't know it. Because the Bible teaches that he that doeth... He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's a knowledge thing. He that sins willfully after he receives the knowledge of the truth, for there is no more sacrifice for sin. So we come down to a knowledge thing. We cannot, that I don't know how many people I've heard to, oh Lord, please forgive us of our unknown sins. Well, if you didn't know about it, it's not a sin. And if it's a sin, you know about it, so don't lie. If you've sinned, yeah, ask God to forgive you. Then don't do it again. If you can't think of anything you've done wrong... Don't let the devil beat you up and tell you that you, can't, that you had to have sinned someplace and not known it. I've had people tell me, oh, well, yes, I acknowledge that I didn't willfully, knowingly disobey God, but I know that I had to have fallen short someplace, and therefore I'm still a sinner. It's like, but sin is a willful transgression of God's law. You cannot unknowingly sin. You have to know it's wrong and do it anyway or know that you, that you have to do it and you didn't do it. Sin is a matter of the heart. So, it is, uh, so you cannot take and act upon the heart and not know what you're doing. Be holy as he is holy. There is no part way. Oh, well, you can never take and quite measure up until after you take and go off into the uh, heaven above, and then maybe then you can be perfect and holy. No, you can be perfect and holy right here, right now. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Bring His Spirit into your life and walk according to His Word. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, starting with the 12th verse. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye shall uh, uh, through the Spirit uh, uh, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have, have not received the spirit of bondage to, again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, there's some things that we need to unpack here. You notice it says we are no longer debtors of the flesh. The debt of the flesh does not control our actions. Just because we were debtors of the flesh and we were at one point in time slaves to sin does not mean we still are. We are not to live after the flesh but after the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one that's supposed to be in control of our lives. 
We need to surrender to the Spirit of God and let Him have control. As we, God has called us to, be, to take in His Spirit and walk as the children of God. It says we have the Spirit of adoption. Now think about that. When you are adopted, you go from being one person's child to being another person's child. That's the whole point of adoption. You went from one family to another family. And it's not that you just simply did something that, well, now they're recognized as being associated with the family. No, they're actually part of the family. Full inheritors. And as such... They have all the rights and responsibilities of anybody else in the family. So when God adopts us into his family, we have all the rights and responsibilities of everybody else in the family, including Jesus Christ. Now when you think about it, Jesus Christ is God. And if we are the adopted sons of God, we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. He may be God, but we are his family. There's authority that comes with that. There's power that comes with that. But there's responsibility that comes with that. I'm going to quote a comic book for a moment. In the Spider-Man comics, over and over and over to beat the dead horse, it's about as much as you can beat a dead horse, they constantly have his Uncle Ben tell, tell him that with great power comes great responsibility. You know that happens to be true. And I know, it's hard to find something true in a comic book. But God gives us great power if we'll act on it, if we'll believe in it, and we use it. But with that comes great responsibility. We have a responsibility to carry on the mission and ministry of God. We have the responsibility to be his emissaries, to live for him here and show the world what it means to be part of the family of God. We have the mission to bring others into the family of God. Let's go forth and carry forth that mission.